and I realized that I didn't want to come back to Zimbabwe and become a textile artist again. I wanted to actually go full time, so I just leapt into it. Mm. Came back with some silk, came back with some paints, and I started doing craft shows and fairs, which again is not fine art. Yep. Uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about, Lynn, is discovering the passion. Uh, the reason why this is so important is because you grew up in like a very different time from me. Uh, most of the things that we're exposed to in terms of careers and whatnot is either through education or through now the internet. Uh, I don't think that was the same for you. <laughs> so how did you discover that you had a passion for art? That's a really interesting question because, as you say, literally the internet has grown around us as in the last even 20 years has yeah. changed absolutely unrecognizably to what most people would have imagined when I was your age. Yeah. Uh, when I was your age, even cell phones were something that Ooh. actually, yep. <laughs> absolutely, even a cell phone was something that was really so unusual and strange. Um, so when I was at school, it was very much a question of landline telephones, hand drawing, people, like my father was a map maker, he drew yeah. all the maps for the geological survey by hand, with hand lettering. There was no computer graphics, yeah. there was no CAD programs. So it was all literally very hands-on. Um, and when I was at school, I was a, a, a good student, I loved school. I always liked doing art, but I tended to move towards the sciences, and it was really interesting that I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. So I did all the sciences at school. I never did officially art at school, but I liked painting and I liked drawing. I always had that in me. And yeah. my grandfather and my great-grandfather and my father were all artistically inclined. So we tended to embrace art as a family. My mother would arrange flowers or I would draw or I would sketch for the school plays or for catalogues. Yeah. But I never officially did art at school. I wanted to be a doctor until my A-level year when I realized I wasn't doing well in mathematics or science. Yeah. And I realized <laughs> biology was a passion. I loved biology, but I thought I was really kind of drifting. And a doctor friend of mine said to me, you think you want to be a doctor? Come with me to Harare Hospital and we'll yeah. do some eye operations with then Dr. Sparrow. <laughs> so I went and watched her doing some eye operations. They were cataract laser removals. And I thought, this is amazing. I love this biology. But then came the aftercare and people care. And being a doctor is not all about sexy operations. It's yeah. actually about the hard care every single day of looking after people and the science of it. And I realized, hang on, I am not a doctor. <laughs> so this is one of the things that's really interesting because a lot of children or teenagers up until the age of 18, do they really know what they want to be? Or do they just go into a track because yeah. their parents think they will? Or exactly. because they, they feel like that's the only thing to do? or their teachers say they should do that. And then literally we had a modeling management course came to our school and did a modeling course with us. And it was so creative and fun and buzzy. And I was in front of a camera so and doing stuff. <laughs> and the one woman said to me, you're not even vaguely a doctor, you should be an <laughs> artist. And so I thought, you know, maybe actually I love art. And I got together a portfolio and I applied to Durban Technicon, which then was called Durban Technicon. Yeah. And I went and did printmaking, but fine art, for three years at Durban Technicon. I left school and went down there. I was very lucky that my, I managed to get a grant to go down. And I spent three years in Durban. And Durban was a turning point for me in terms of realizing that I was an artistic personality rather yeah. than a science personality that I loved being alternative, that I loved people who pushed the envelope and who questioned. So, I mean, those were the years when it was the 1980s and we were on the verge yeah, of independence yeah. in Zimbabwe, but South Africa was still very much under apartheid. Deep in apartheid. And so there was a very repressive feeling around Durban, but in the art college we were very free and we mixed freely. And for me that was a really interesting learning curve and trying to manage that with the knowledge of of how it worked as, a, as an artist. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and the technology, as you were saying, then was we were all hands-on. Uh, so, yeah, there were no cell phones, there was no iPad drawing, yeah. there was nothing like no that. No addictions to Instagram. <laughs> so, you know, my, my learning was picking up a pencil and I was really lucky that my 
life drawing instructor was a man called Hugh Dent, who used to be the director of the National Gallery in Zimbabwe, as it was then Rhodesia. Yeah. But he had gone to Natal Technicon and he had become the director of the whole Technicon, but he took life drawing classes. So for me, my mantra became to say to any artist, whether you've got technology or not, life drawing, 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 drawing with a pencil is probably the best way to start learning about yourself as an yeah. artist. Pick up a pencil and draw. Just, and so yeah. my years of art school was hand drawing and working a lot with printmaking, some painting, some sculpture, but mostly printmaking, so silkscreen lithography and etching. Yeah. Um, and I did three years of that. That's and interesting, came, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe the thing I would ask you is, um, because with artists, there's always uh, two types of artists. There's like the self-taught artist like Basqua, who absolutely loves you. And there's you, you went to like um, an institution to learn, right? Uh, what do you think you got uh, from uh, the institution that you might not have gotten uh, by yourself? Yeah, that's an interesting one, which I often think about. Um, Oh, that's a good question. I think it's really important in certain respects because it does give you an incredible history of art. And I know a lot of people kind of tend to ignore that. But yeah. art history um, is something that we can all learn from. And even if you think, well, that's an old Greek statue. Um, what has it got to do with me? Yeah. Or I can just go and Google anything I want to know about any artist. It's still a question of digging into that and learning and in our day we were learning it physically by writing essays instead of we couldn't just go to Wikipedia and find yeah, out about like Rembrandt. <laughs> so I think the art history was a big thing, that formal art education and I've noticed I think even the art education that you get in Zimbabwe right now, I think that some of that gives you a good sense of art history. They try to yeah. give you that feeling of art history and it's something that you should actually embrace because it's not that you're trying to copy the old ways, it's that you're learning from them and working your own better ways. Yeah. And when you consider the fact that as artists we're working now, we are creating the history of 200 years time. So we're going to, we yeah, are actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, and especially my age, we're beginning to be part of art history. Yeah, you're the guys but, who will be studied like 50, 60 years Well, we from hope now. so. We hope we won't be just <laughs> like left behind. <laughs> but I mean, people like Basqua has just got that instinctive love of art. And we laughed about it when I first met him because he yeah. said, hey, Lynn, you were my hero in school. I loved your art. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of continuity for me is very heartwarming because I yeah. think that it transcends age, gender, uh, it transcends politics. Art yeah. has got an, an incredible cohesive factor. And whether it's hand drawing with a pencil or drawing on your iPad, yeah. um, it's still incredibly accessible to everybody. And it cuts across class, race, gender, attitude. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I think yeah. the technology is interesting and important, and obviously we embrace technology as we go on. But does, what doesn't change is your own inner sense of just creating for the sake of creating what you want to say. Yeah. Whether it's with a pencil or with, a, with an iPad. Yeah. yeah. So or, it's interesting. Or, yeah, or, with, or with poetry, if you're, if you're doing hip hop so rap. so many different mediums, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so, so that brings me to an interesting thing, uh, because, um, like you said, you can use uh, different mediums to express different messages. Uh, and when I go through your art, at least more recently, because uh, like I said, 30 years of work, uh, the, the thing that stands out to me is, uh, you use your art uh, more now to speak about, you know, environmentalism, uh, landscapes, uh, wild animals. Why, why is this uh, the message that is on your mind and that you're pushing through your art like at the moment? So I think that's kind of been a general trend all the way through from the beginning of my art, strangely enough. And I guess it's because I had a really strong interest in biology. And you natural world, that. you know, yeah, biology, I was an A student and I loved it. And I love the natural world and I love knowing about what's around me. And um, whether it's people or animals, as far as I'm concerned, biology is also very much people. Yeah. So when you say animals, I'm kind of feeling like we're all animals. We're all okay, on this planet. I hear that. <laughs> we're all connected. So my mantra really is hashtag all things connected. I mean, that's if you wanted to say anything about me, I guess you could say 
Lynn is hashtag all things connected. Yes, like <laughs> because the relationship between I just, people. I really believe that we're part of this whole big web of life. Okay. Um, whether it's just the universe and the world within that, or whether it's our own little homes, or whether it's us being in the bush with wild animals, or us sitting in a community watching somebody putting on an incredible dance or theatre presentation or listening yeah. to a poet, everything's connected. And so, to me, animals and people all have equal places in all of that thread. And I'm just lucky enough that I live in a wild place, which yeah. is the Savi Valley Conservancy. And we are surrounded by the big five. It comes with its challenges because yeah. we obviously have huge amounts of concern trying to protect animals and also maintain incredible community conservation efforts. Yeah. So to me, conservation and community are very much linked. And I obviously have this incredible wildlife to paint. And I live with wild dogs, African wild dogs. And yeah. when they're denning, I sleep, eat and breathe African wild dogs. And even Helen Leros once said to me, Lynn, I do not exhibit wild animal paintings, but you do just get wild dogs. Yeah. <laughs> because because I've, I also seriously believe, back to the pencil thing, that whatever you paint or draw, do it from real life, do it from your own experience. Okay. Um, and you, yeah, you can learn from Rembrandt or whatever, and obviously it's relevant, but do it from what you're seeing or experiencing. So if you're experiencing an incredible sunset or a wild dog or an incredible dance yeah. under, under an African sky or whether if you're experiencing an inner city travail or somebody as happened to me the other day dying in front of you from a drug overdose that yeah. happens yeah, those true. things happen in life yeah. so you can take that good and the bad but that's the direct experience that you bring to your art yeah. And so, yeah, I've painted a lot of animals in my time and I will always carry on painting African wild dogs because yeah. I'm very concerned about their um, endangered species and um, the preservation of them. So I'm always working and contributing towards trying to help that awareness of wild dogs. Yeah. But I think that the bottom line is all things connected. And so I'm painting a lot of human figures now. Um, yeah, I'm kind of take, taking flight. Uh, I painted a lot of human figures at art college back to the Hugh Dent days. Uh, life drawing was my absolute passion. So for me, a pencil and a human form is something of a joy. And whether it's a human form or a tree or an animal, I find that same joy in just depicting life. Yeah. So yeah, I've got an, certainly an interest in the wildlife side, but I like to say maybe I'm more of a, instead of wildlife artist, yeah. I'm a wild art artist. So to me, wild is, it's what's all around us. I mean, wild is even in our own gardens, it's watching birds, yeah. it's watching people's interaction with nature and the world that they live in, yeah. all things connected. Fair enough, I so, hear that. Yeah, I my art that. is encompassing a lot more very abstract concepts as well, uh, night skies. It can be just a big swath of green or blue. Yeah. And I'm pushing towards trying to say more with less brush strokes than I ever used to. Ooh, that's so fair. Why? Trying to stay more with less is kind of like a Chinese, Japanese calligraphy type feeling. One stroke can actually capture the feeling of a body instead of sitting yeah. and trying to capture every little bit of it you can just kind of get the feeling yeah and so i think that's what i'm trying to go towards. that's what you're going for yeah. i think i saw that reflected in um that video i sent you from your youtube with uh with the charcoal yes. like the strokes were very just one yeah just yeah, it was very, yeah. I love that, I love that, I hear that. And now that you explain it, I'm seeing that video again. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's kind of in this painting here, has a similar feeling. I mean, this is a bit more finished because I've rubbed shadows and, and molding and, and yeah. shape into the body. But again, the strokes are very free and very few. And just to get a feeling of definition mm. um, and movement. Like you can tell what it is, yeah. but it's not like ultra-realistic or... Yeah. So I think if anything with my art, I would like to be in a position of saying I'm trying to head towards going for saying more, but with less, with less. Um, not less effort, but with a less actual movement on the canvas. Yeah, yeah, yeah I hear that. And I did I Chinese that. calligraphy years ago. I lived in Singapore for a little while uh -huh. um, and I did Chinese calligraphy and drawing and I realized then how much you can say with just one brush stroke. I love that. I yeah. love that. And Beautiful so, simplicity. Yeah, that's interesting because 
the the fact that you're mentioning now like Chinese uh, China and Singapore, right? Um, and we've got like the Durban experience, like so many experiences coming together, and then like Cultures. Yeah, yeah, being reflected in in your art. Uh, and maybe maybe the question I would ask there is from Africa, right? From your experience in in in, in Durban and here. Did you see like a massive difference, like uh, culturally, and uh, a massive difference at least reflected in the art when uh, you were in China? In my own art. Yeah. No, no, no. In in the art there, like. Yeah, I think in those days, fairly obviously, there was a lot of um, Chinese brushstroke painting, which I was looking at, and the very traditional Chinese art. But I think actually Chinese art has grown in huge leaps and bounds yeah. over the last few years in terms of it's actually a key player in modern art. And yeah, yeah. So I don't know, I just think that art's such a universal experience that, uh, yes, you can, artists in Africa will be painting possibly in a certain way, especially if they're not exposed to other art from other places. Yeah. Or the same in China, or the same in Northern America, wherever you are. But I think that the commonality of art, that expression, is going to kind of seep through and there's a common thread yeah. that's going to always, yeah. all things like, connected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, everyone is just living life. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. soaking up those experiences. And yeah. I'm just, I'm finding the Zimbabwe art scene so powerful at the moment in terms of, there are people who are kind of maybe painting what they think will sell and maybe just, not necessarily doing their own kind of art, yeah. but I think they're few and far between. I actually think that there's a lot of people, um, especially young artists, who are willing to push the envelope and try innovative ideas. And particularly when you live on the edge, as we have yeah. to admit, we all live on the edge in Zimbabwe. Yep. You never quite know what's going to happen next. Yeah. It's a volatile <laughs> situation where we actually create huge waves for such a little country. Yeah. And you never quite know where you're going to be going. And that creates a certain degree of, not instability, but uncertainty. Yeah. And I honestly feel like that breeds a huge amount of creativity because you bounce off each other. You have to survive. You throw ideas around. Yeah. Life doesn't come easy. You have to make a plan. And you have to make a plan about how your equipment is going to work. And mm -hmm. if you can even <laughs> afford to buy light bulbs for your photographic lights or yeah. whatever, yeah. Studio so you, get, equipment. you get innovative <laughs> and Zessa goes off and you have to work with candles yeah. and you, because you're on the edge, I think you create more intensely and I yeah. feel like the art that's coming out of Zimbabwe is saying something. It's not easy art, it's not comfortable art. It's kind of that. trying to say something. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I think I Zimbabweans that. are making waves. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. Um, there's, <laughs> and we were talking about this at the Basqua uh, exhibition when we actually met, yeah. is that there's just like a, an, an energy, a positive momentum in art right now. And that's and not just art painting, that's poetry, literature. Music, I mean, our Zimbabwean yeah. writers are world class. Yeah. There's yeah. some that seriously just turn out stuff because every Zimbabwean seems to think they can write a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to say that. But there are some and many incredible writers who are really becoming recognized worldwide and poets, uh, sculptors. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the paintings. It's, yeah. it's and just theater, art and theater and dance. Ooh, I mean, there's just yeah. so much going so on. So much talent, so much, so yeah. much work Photography, uh, being put out. Um, film. Yep. Yeah. yeah, music, yeah. all of it. Music, huge all of one. It. Yeah. And and so um, I want to touch on something uh, that we will tie when we come back to your next exhibition, right? Uh, one of the things that intrigued me when I was uh, just following you on Instagram, uh, seeing the little videos that you post, uh, the like behind the scenes type videos, uh, you use charcoal a lot. Uh, in your in your painting, I think there's some there. Lots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, why is that? Like, is that something you discovered? How did you discover that? And why did you take like such a liking to, to charcoal? Yeah, that's an interesting one as well because I think at art college again, maybe more than in art college these days. Yeah. Charcoal was one of the things we worked with. It was life drawing. If you were doing life drawing, you were working with charcoal. Okay. And it's, a, it's quite a forgiving medium, so if you make mistakes with charcoal, you can easily rub it out. Yeah. 
but it's also very expressive. Um, somebody like William Kentridge really uses charcoal to his ultimate expression. Yeah. Uh, so I just think that it was my roots in art, uh, charcoal, more than a pencil. A pencil is, is quite, quite a sterile mark compared to me, for me, compared yeah. to charcoal. Other people might feel differently, and rightly so. Yeah. So for me, charcoal is very elemental. It's kind of, it's of the earth, it's of fire. I am very possibly obsessed with fire in the last few years because we've gone through house fires and a fire at our, our um, home in the bush. Yeah. So we've actually had a lot of experience of bad fires and Johnson himself, who's going to be a, an associate of mine in our next exhibition, yeah. Johnson Zuse has also experienced house fires and the, the destruction that that brings. Yeah. So charcoal is kind of, a, and also the destruction of landscape to create charcoal can be very invasive. So the willow charcoal that the British painters would use yeah. uh, would be created from willow trees. I, and I'm really not sure how sustainable that is. But charcoal in Zimbabwe tends to have negative connotations because it's made from forests which are not going to be replanted. Yeah. And it's used to burn and, and it's gone. So charcoal is a very interesting subject. Uh, I tend to make my own charcoal if I can. So. Yeah. I'll burn old hardwood um, Mapani poles because we live in a Mapani area. Uh, and I do it obviously on a very really small level in a sustainable yeah. way. And yeah. I just find that it, the marks that it makes are very elemental. So get back to saying something with one stroke of charcoal, there's so much expression there which you wouldn't get with a pencil. Yep. And then you can paint right over it and it's gone. You, <laughs> you lose it, but the feeling of it is still underneath there. Yeah. And it comes back to the whole fire thing, and I guess um, working towards this exhibition, which I have been for three or four years now, in my mind, yeah. fire creates charcoal. Um, fire is a force, and it creates charcoal, which can be negative for the environment, but it can also be a force for good, because it's cooking, it's keeping people warm, it's feeding people. Exactly. It's um, and fire is this kind of destructive factor, which also has really positive repercussions as well. So a fire is a really double-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, we hate fire, but we love it and we need it. We don't, we <laughs> we don't want it, it to burn yeah. our house down, but, but we want fire we to want sit to around it, it and tell stories and cook a pot of soup or sadza. Yeah. Um, so fire is a really big uh, issue yeah. for me. And charcoal is of fire, like diamonds are of fire. Um, it's all of this, the natural, all things connected yeah. theme that I just enjoy using something as elemental as charcoal. I'm yeah. getting towards using it more and more. You live in Sare Conservative Valley, uh, away from the cities. <laughs> Do you, was that like a conscious thing that aids with the art or was, just that it was, uh, was it just a thing that, it's just a thing? Or is it like a conscious choice where you're like, I, I function better when I'm away from like the, the crazy pace of the city is what was happening there. So that's a really interesting one, and I know you're intrigued because you yeah. love cities and you yeah. can't imagine living in the bush. I can't imagine. Not seeing anybody and staring at the sunset yeah, for six I'm days about in a row. Like the internet and connectivity. I know you, we get internet in the bush. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> in fact, sometimes more than Harari. But yeah, I think from an early childhood, I was always really loving being outdoors and loving nature. So yeah. nature and wildlife has always been a part of my life and of my father's and his father before him and we're third generation Zimbabwean. Yeah. So we've always lived outdoors, loved outdoors. Um, his father was a cattle farmer, then my father was a cartographer. But we always went outdoors to do stuff. We always went to Nyanga or went to Mana Pools yeah. or you know we went camping. So nature was part of what I was comfortable with and animals and so it's something that doesn't come as a hardship to me I enjoy it yeah. and I live with my life partner Clive Stockel who's a really respected conservationist and community liaison personality in the southeast Lowfeld. Uh, he yeah. speaks Shangon and Shona probably in a more high manner than a lot of Shangon and Shona <laughs> speakers so he's very integrated with the community and the community is very much part of our lives and for me, living in a bush rural existence and being part of a rural community gives me an incredible insight into very strong culture and stories and um, 
very satisfying surroundings that is not just wildlife, it's actually yeah. a really big people surrounding as well. So it's a very different world to a city, but I actually thrive on the two opposites, back to, yeah. the, back to the two extremes. I actually love being in a big city. I love it when I ever get a chance to go yeah. to London or New York or to just do the galleries in Houston or somewhere you know, in the old, long ago I used to travel a lot more than I do now. Yeah. Because financial restraints weren't so heavy then. But so I love big cities I lo and I love Harare. I love the buzz. There's always something going on. There's always yep. a good new restaurant. <laughs> there's always some theatre. There's always a good poet to listen to. There's always the fabric party to go exactly. to. <laughs> there's always picture gallery to go and hang out. There's good food there at Emma Gawaini. There's yeah. stuff going on all the time in Harare, which is really very valuable and I find it very stimulating. But I find it just as stimulating to be sitting in the bush yeah. and for one week just to be watching wild dogs and following along behind them and, str and drawing wild dogs. Yeah. So I like the two extremes. Fair I actually enough. I Fair thrive enough. on the two extremes and I, I love nature and I love culture. So it whether it feeds it's, you in different ways. And you get culture and nature in a city in different ways yeah. and you get it in the bush in different ways. In different ways. It's just different levels. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. I, I, I yeah. love that. I love that. So and I like them both equally, I guess. And I could paint. I work and I paint anywhere I am. If I'm traveling, even when I was traveling for business as a yeah. textile designer, I would be painting in Germany or I would be painting in Florida or I would be painting in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, I paint in Harare, I paint in the bush. I paint on my dining room table, I paint wherever I am because it's just part of me. It's just, you can't, So yeah. I don't need to be anywhere in particular <laughs> to paint. I find inspiration wherever I am. And yeah. it can be people, it can be food, it can be whatever. Yeah. I love that. I love that because it reminds me of um, a conversation I was having with, with my mom, I think last year. <laughs> and I was explaining to her that um, it's hard for me to stop doing this because if, if I had a guest who I thought was really intriguing and the only place we could shoot in is like under a tree, I would just set my tripod up and we'd have to shoot because we just have to do it. <laughs> and it would probably be more powerful because of that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so I love that yeah. little parallel, despite us being in like very different worlds, that creative expression is just always calling. Um, uh, a thing I want to talk to you about uh, is uh, sustainability. Before we started, you were asking me, um, how do you sustain this, right? And, and that's a question that is posed to every creative. It doesn't matter what medium, you're a poet, you're a painter, how do you're you live? a storyteller. <laughs> how do you survive? <laughs> and, and so for you, how long did it uh, take for you to be able to actually become like a full-time fan artist? And uh, what does uh, that look like today? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. And it's one that I sometimes agonize over because yeah. today it is not so easy to earn a living as it was for me, say, eight to ten years ago. Okay. So I just feel like I am working harder and harder for less and less return, but in some ways more satisfyingly. But I think what it was when I started off I came out of Durban Art College after three years and I was an art student and yeah. I graduated and I thought I was going to hit the world and I was going to be an artist. Yeah. <laughs> and I came back to Zimbabwe in 1980, we just had independence. Everything was exciting and it was interesting and things were happening, but still, just coming out of college or any, any starting artist comes out and goes, hello world, here I am, I'm an artist, yeah. and the world goes, Okay. Who are you? Who are you? You're like so, you, you feel so small. And especially these days with social media, there's a million other people out there all looking for the same yeah. slot. Yeah. And I've realized very fast that I had to climb off my high horse and get a job because I wasn't going to just be an artist and I had no backup. So I got a job as a textile designer mm. and although I didn't think that's what I wanted to do, for 10 years, I was a good textile designer and I loved it. I enjoyed it. I put my heart and soul into it. I never painted for myself within those 10 years because yeah. to be a fine artist is kind of like making music or being a really good cook. Yeah. It's something that you have to work 24 seven at it. And you can't do that and hold down a day job. Or if you do, yeah. something does suffer. Yeah. So I had a day job as a textile designer for 10 years with an amazing company in 
Harari called Screen Tone. Yeah. And those were, in, well, that was an era when the cotton industry in Zimbabwe was really strong. We had good cotton, we had good fabrics, we had good artists in terms of the textiles. We were producing world quality textiles. Yeah. And I think we can get back to that again. I think it's beginning to, to come back in terms of textile production. So I had 10 years of textile designing and traveling for textiles and to shows. So I yeah. would travel a little bit to Germany or to Holland. And I had a really good um, experience of being a paid employee. But eventually, after 10 years, I realized that it was just getting to be too much. And yeah. I've done it for 10 years. <laughs> And that's what a lot of art, wannabe art students or artists sometimes struggle with, is how to be an artist when you're fresh out of college and you want yeah. to be an artist. But. And you can be an artist all you want, but you maybe won't be able to buy a loaf of bread. So that's the dichotomy of yeah. trying to know what do you do? Do you get another job? And the, uh, sadly, the bottom line is you find other jobs, you find ways to earn an income until you can establish yourself enough and maybe mature enough as well to kind of start realizing how your art career can progress. Yeah. So yeah. for me, the realization came when I went and lived a short time in Singapore and I was lucky enough to do my Chinese brushstroke painting there because I was in Singapore for a few months. I did some Chinese brushstroke painting and I started working with silk and I realized that I didn't want to come back to Zimbabwe and become a textile artist again. I wanted to actually go full time. So I just leapt into it. Yeah. Came back with some silk, came back with some paints, and I started doing craft shows and fairs, which again is not fine art. Yeah. But I just got out there and I started showing people what I was doing. And that's the thing is how do you expose your work? And then there was no internet. Yep. I wasn't going to get on YouTube <laughs> And, and I wasn't, and and I wasn't going to get on Instagram. Uh, Instagram. <laughs> and even if you are, no matter how good you are, all those things are very competitive. Yeah. So unless you've got a niche market that's looking at you, you're just one voice in hundreds. Yeah. And so you've got to actually just bite the bullet and start showing people what you do and physically show up and be there. Going out. Whole canvases, whole easels. Sweat blood for years and years yeah. in terms of, <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of artists come to me these days and say, how did you, how can you sell, you know, can we just, can you just sell for us and how do you do it? And I'm going, you've got to sweat the tears and you've got to sweat the blood <laughs> because it's exactly. hard work. Exactly. Uh, and sometimes you wake up every day kind of crying and thinking, why am I doing what this? What am I even doing? Exactly. Especially, uh, yeah. <laughs> like you were saying, uh, like you were saying initially is that uh, you find yourself working harder and harder, but it feels like for less. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you said an interesting thing more satisfyingly. Um, yes, yeah. So maybe this is like a philosophical question, <laughs> yes. but um, th that, that balance between uh, the satisfaction to create and survival, at, at this stage of your career, which one do you give in to more? <laughs> That's such an interesting question because you're making me really think about it now. And I think one of the reasons why I'm saying I'm working harder and harder for less and less is because I'm giving away a little bit the need to get money in and I'm giving away more to the need to actually really create and say what I want to say. Yeah. Um, and I'm very lucky that I've had a long career in art where I have generally built up an amazing group of people who have bought my work in yeah. various genres over the years. So I'm certainly not rich, but I have managed to pay my bills. Yeah. And I think that's, if any artist can just pay their bills, that's one thing that they can actually count themselves lucky. Yeah. Because whatever art you're in, whether it's music or theater or painting. Mm. Yeah, even this. <laughs> even, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, your lights are on, so you're obviously paying your bills. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you can pay your bills, you don't have to try and be rich. If you can be happy and satisfied with what you're doing, I think then that recognition comes from that. You know, you can copy and stress and try and paint what will sell, but if you're doing something that you really feel for, I think that the recognition will grow from that to make you more solvent or to make you more stable. Yeah. Um, trusting in the process is not easy sometimes. And it's really <laughs> tough. It's really <laughs> tough, especially when you have a family or children to put through school. 
Yeah. You know, I was lucky a lot of the time in my life. I had buffers at certain times when I needed it. A lot of people don't have that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you know, yeah. my experience is certainly not necessarily anybody You're else's. Reflective of, of anyone yeah. else's. Yeah. Um, but I just feel like I have reached a stage in my life where I feel like I can sell a certain amount to know that I can hopefully get through a year of paying bills and covering my medical yeah. aid. Um, and it frees me in a way to go, okay, what the heck, I'm going to do like an exhibition that I'm planning yeah. now. I'm going to do something, burnt offerings, it's close to my heart. We've had fires, we've had trauma. Yeah. And as families or as humans, we all go through all of these kind of trials of life, whatever they are. Yeah. And it can be emotional or physical. But somehow you rise above all that. And that includes money problems as well. Yeah. And so my exhibition, hopefully now, which I'm doing with Johnson Zuse and my daughter Kelly Barker, who's yeah. a makeup artist, I think that that is something I've really been planning for. And I'm almost not thinking of the financial implications. Yeah. I know those <laughs> you will just come. Have to do those it. will come. <laughs> but I'm just doing it because I feel like I've got such a strong passion to get it done. And yeah. I've got the support of some really amazing creatives. So we're just going for it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, a bit of an yeah. unknown and it is scary. Yeah. But that comes with being a creative. Always. If you're not a if you're unknown, not a real creative, in you're fog. gonna exactly. <laughs> it's not a safe, comfortable yeah. place. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. And so the last thing I'll ask you is Burnt Offerings, the exhibition. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A collaborative of three artists coming together. Um, why was it important to you? Because like you said, uh, deeply, deeply personal, man. Uh, these fires that uh, you went through twice. Deeply personal experience, but you've chosen uh, a collaborative medium to actually express. I mean, Kelly is also your daughter, so she's uh, part of, she's probably was there for part of these experiences, but uh, Johnson is not. Uh, so why uh, go through like the collaborative medium for, for this exhibition? Good question. Um, why do we choose partners in life? I think sometimes it's just serendipity or God hands them to you, uh, or everybody's in the right place at the right time. Yeah. <laughs> but with Johnson, it was a question of, uh, I first met Johnson at Gallery Delta, and there was an exhibition called Equity at which I was showing a piece of artwork. Uh, yeah. Gallery Delta was Helen Leros and Derek Huggins. Mm -hmm. And this was years and years ago. I met Johnson, who had a piece on the exhibition called Beautiful Struggle. And I, at that point, didn't really even know the story behind the artwork, but I just liked it. And I wanted it for my daughter. Uh, it's an amazing, interesting piece, yeah. which I'll probably put onto Instagram and show yeah. people, because yeah. uh, it was... As I found out later, it was a piece that was created out of his parents' house fire that he'd salvaged pieces out of their fire and made this beautiful struggle artwork. Yeah. I came yeah. in and bought it for Kelly for a gift and met Johnson through the years rolling along after that. And yeah. so we kind of maintained a knowing of each other, but we didn't really interact a lot. And then I went through my house fire and that burnt offerings was on the wall and that got burnt. So <laughs> it's like a second so, time. <laughs> second time around. Johnson collected all this burnt stuff from his house fire. It went on my wall and it went through my house fire. Yeah. And Kelly and I lost a lot of stuff. Um, she was very much in that whole process with me. Yeah. And we took it to Johnson then and we said, Johnson, will you recreate? Because we had all these kind of burnt, warped pieces. Yeah. <laughs> he recreated it for us and it's back on our wall. Ooh, so it's beautiful. been recycled. <laughs> and so I, our relationship with Johnson just grew. Uh, Johnson and I see eye to eye. Yeah. Helen Leros said to me, Johnson draws with wire. And I think that always resonated. I draw with charcoal yeah. and I love the process of drawing. Johnson draws with wire. That's his medium, and he just gets it. Mm. Uh, Kelly draws with makeup, paint, and mm. she also paints herself, but she draws on bodies. Yeah. So between me drawing on canvases um, and some installation work, a lot of draped canvases I'm yeah. working with, and Johnson drawing with wire, and Kelly drawing on bodies, we've got this kind of threesome which just seems to work. Yeah. And yeah. We've talked about it for a long time, about doing something. Kelly and I often collaborate, and when I do an exhibition, she'll do body painting. 
to complement the exhibition yeah. and it really works very well because she's a consummate artist in her own right. And so Johnson and I have been talking about doing it for a long time and when we met Basqua, it, was it just felt like, okay, this place works, Basqua works, Picture Gallery is the right vibe, it's edgy, it's young, it's dynamic, it's yeah. not set in its ways. Yeah. Um, it's not a it's not a, a pretentious space. It's a space for not people. Not at all. Yeah. And so yeah. we just kind of felt comfortable there. And yeah, Kelly Johnson and I and Basqua got together and decided let's do this. He was very really accommodating and wonderful, yeah. wonderfully supportive. Uh, his brother Fadzai has been incredibly supportive. And then on to the team came Kuda Chakwas. Yeah, brilliant artist uh, as well. Yeah, very good artist in his own right and a very learned personality, but also wonderfully accessible. Yeah. And he's now curating this exhibition for us. So it's kind of like just collaborations. Yeah. And out of all of that has grown the fact that Kelly is now, as a makeup artist, creating an actual art film to go with this exhibition, which is going to be called Burnt Offerings, Reinvention, Taking Flight. Yeah. And her art film is going to be body art, dance, theatre, stating her personal journey as well. So the exhibition won't just be body art, wire, found objects art and paintings. Canvas, right. It's going yeah. to be an art film rolling as well. Yeah. That's beautiful. We're going to have beautiful. a lot of stuff going on. It's going to be really interesting. <laughs> I can't wait for 2nd of June, right? Yes, 2nd of June yeah. opening. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. love that. I love that. Yeah. But yeah, thank you so much for coming and pouring this knowledge into all of us, myself and everyone else who's going to watch this. Uh, I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate even more hearing your insights as well, because I think you bring some really interesting questions to me, which yeah. are... I'm going to go home and have a and lot think of about. things to think about. Yeah. yeah, so thank you. I've really appreciated the chat. Thank you. Very special. Thank you.